point, if you are working on um, the background questions in the beginning part of the lab, if you could just close that out and put that aside for now. We're going to talk through the next little section of notes, which explains how we kind of go through and analyze a sample of DNA that was, say, collected at a crime scene. So we can use this for other things as well. Um, you might have time to go back and continue working on the background part of this lab a little bit later. A lot of what we talk about is the same information that you're reading and writing about in the first part of the lab. So we'll come back to that in a little while. We're just going to go through and talk about kind of how this would work. And this is kind of, we can't, we don't have the technology to do every step of this analysis as we go through, but we're replicating part of it so that you get the basic idea. We're going to start today by kind of backing up and talking about if this was real DNA from a real crime scene, what would we have to do before we run the electrophoresis to kind of get those samples ready? Because there's a few steps we have to do just to kind of prepare the samples. Keep in mind as we talk through this today, we're talking about these um, technologies and techniques in the context of a crime scene, but all of these can be used for other things as well. There are a lot of genes that we might want to um, copy and separate and learn things about for other reasons besides just a crime scene investigation. So this can also be used, like we talked about a couple days ago, um, things like paternity tests, um, you can run analysis like this on foods to see if they contain the ingredients that they say they contain to identify kind of what types of organisms um, are in that food or to identify if they contain genetically modified things. Um, you can use this type of analysis to look for certain disease causing genes as well. So there's lots of applications of this. We're just using kind of the story of a crime scene analysis to think about how this would work. So we go back to the beginning. There was this crime, this painting got stolen or whatever, and we gathered some samples and we got some DNA from the crime scene and from a bunch of suspects. Frequently at a crime scene, you may not get very much DNA, right? And if that's a really important piece of your evidence, the first thing you wanna do is make as many copies of that genetic code as you can so you have enough to actually use for the tests you want to run. And so if somebody's walking across a lab and drops a test tube, you didn't lose all of your evidence right there, right? Um, this is also true if you, say, get a little bit of DNA out of an organism, maybe a fossil that was found, had a little remnant of something that you could extract some DNA. You're not going to get very much. And so anytime you have a really limited supply, the first thing you want to do is make lots of copies of that gene. The technique that we use to make many, many copies of a piece of DNA is called PCR. That stands for polymerase chain reaction. You should recognize the word polymerase. That's that enzyme that helps build DNA during DNA replication. Polymerase chain reaction is another technology that takes advantage of what we know about how DNA copies itself to make many, many copies in a laboratory, and so this is called in vitro, that means in glass, instead of natural DNA replication that happens in your cells, that would be called in vivo, in life. We can also do this in a laboratory. This process is also sometimes referred to as gene cloning or DNA cloning. We're not cloning an entire organism, but cloning is basically making an identical copy of something, right? And so here we're making an identical copy of a certain stretch of DNA. So I'm going to show you a little animation just to see how this works. Um, and we're going to go through and just look at this and I'll kind of highlight a couple of the main steps here. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Oh, I hate when this doesn't line up. You guys got to start telling me to align my smart board like the instant you walk into class because apparently fourth hour is when it quits working. There we go. Okay. So the purpose of the polymerase chain reaction is to amplify or make lots and lots of copies of a strand of DNA. 
So we're going to go through and kind of look at how this process works. So if this is part of the DNA and there's a gene in here that we want to make a bunch of copies of, the first thing we have to do is separate the two strands of the double helix. So that's called denaturing the DNA, making it come apart. They do that in this process by heating it. This middle section kind of between the red and the blue that you see there, that's what we call the gene of interest. That's the part that we want a lot of copies of. We don't really care about the stuff way on the ends, but it's that middle gene that we really want to make copies of. So in the laboratory, they develop primers, those starting sequences, um, that are complementary to the two ends of that section that we really want. So then we add the primers in there, and you can see there's one on each end. They attach themselves to complementary bases on both sides, and then we allow them to extend. And so they put in a polymerase molecule. It's called TAC polymerase because it's not exactly the same one that we have in our cells, but it's an enzyme that does a similar type of job. It's just a slightly different version of it. And that's the first cycle. And then they kind of repeat this process several times. And you'll see as we do this over and over, so we take the DNA apart, we add the primers, and then we extend those primers. And you can see here, by the end of this second cycle, we have two segments in here, that third line from the top and third line from the bottom, that are just the gene that we want, just only that part of the DNA. So then we keep going, and they repeat this cycle many, many times. So they separate those strands, they add the primers, they extend those primers. And as we repeat these cycles, you'll see the ones with the arrows next to them, all of those strands of DNA are just that middle section that we want. And since we're doubling this every single time, over a very short amount of time, um, we actually get like thousands and thousands of copies. So we're gonna skip to the final graph. So we start with just a few copies, but very, very quickly after 30 cycles, you can see we have over a million copies of the gene that we want. Or is that a trillion? Thousand? Million? Trillion. That's like a trillion copies of the gene that we want. So just by repeating that cycle over and over and over, we isolate that segment of DNA that we want, and we copy and copy and copy and copy it many, many times. That's PCR, that's the polymerase chain reaction. And the chain reaction is just the fact that it repeats over and over and over like that to make lots and lots of copies. So now we have plenty of DNA to work with and run all kinds of analyses on, and it's all the same sequence because we just replicated it. So now we can go to the next part of our analysis. And those are just the things we just looked at on there. So now we've got all these copies. Now we have to do some kind of analysis. If we're at a crime scene, part of the deal is we want to figure out which of the suspect's DNA matches the crime scene, right? To see if they were at least there. Keep in mind, just because we find their DNA there does not prove they're guilty. It proves they were there, but it doesn't prove guilt. Just a little technicality for anybody legally minded. We do this by taking advantage of the fact that each individual's DNA is slightly different. And when I say slightly different, like it's a really, really tiny percentage of our DNA that actually is different amongst each individual human. The vast majority of it is the same, which should kind of make sense because we all need the same proteins to carry out chemical reactions and transport things in and out of cells and all of that. So most of our DNA is the same. But there are some places, especially what we call non-coding regions, the part of our DNA that don't code for proteins. So they're just kind of like the in-between stretches of DNA, where if mutations or differences happen there, it doesn't matter. And so there's no selection there. And so mutations and changes tend to build up in those in-between sections. And so when we're doing these analyses, we focus on those in-between regions that can either be called, they're kind of two names depending on what you're reading. They can be called STRs, which stands for short tandem repeats. Often in these in-between sections, there'll be a short segment of DNA 
or of base pairs that repeats over and over and over. It might just be A-T-T-A, A-T-T-A, A-T-T-A. And it might repeat three times in my DNA and five times in your DNA because there was a mutation somewhere in there. These can also be called VNTRs, variable number tandem repeats. Same idea, just a slightly different name for it. So these are the sections that we kind of use when we're doing this kind of analysis. The other tool that we use to look at this, so this just kind of illustrates what I just said there. Um, we're looking at two different STR short tandem repeat sites here. And in this case, the first site is the same. They have the same number at the crime scene of the suspect. But at the second site, they don't match. So that means that this DNA we found at the crime scene is not that suspect because they have more repeats of that sequence. So the tool we use to help us figure this out um, is something called a restriction enzyme. A restriction enzyme is an enzyme, it's a protein whose job is to cut DNA at a specific sequence. In this case, for this example, we're saying that this enzyme recognizes the sequence ATTTA, and anytime it finds that sequence, it always cuts the DNA between the second and third T. Different restriction enzymes no, um, look for different sequences, so it's not always this one. It's unique to the enzyme, and there are different types of restriction enzymes. And so if there's even a little difference in people's DNA, especially in these short repeating segments, it changes how that restriction enzyme works. And I'm gonna show you how this would um, end up in just a minute. But first of all, restriction enzymes are actually something that occurs naturally. Scientists discovered these in bacteria and they actually function in bacteria as a defense mechanism. Bacteria naturally have these enzymes in them so that when bacteriophages, remember those are viruses that attack bacteria, when the virus injects its DNA into the bacteria, those um, restriction enzymes will recognize sequence in the bacteria DNA and they snip the bacterial DNA, or sorry, the virus's DNA, they snip the virus's DNA into all kinds of little pieces because then the virus DNA doesn't work anymore and it can't replicate itself and it basically stops the virus from infecting them. Their own DNA is protected. It's got all these methyl groups on it that protect it from being cut up like that, but it's a defensive mecha mechanism in bacteria. So that's where these came from. They exist in nature to do the same job. And this is one of those cases where we're just kind of taking advantage of these enzymes and using them for our own purpose. So if we take that enzyme that always cuts that ATTTA sequence and use it on those two samples of person A and B, you can see in the first person, it found that sequence three times and it cut their DNA three times. Anytime it finds that sequence, it chops the DNA up. But person B had a mutation in the middle of that strand and so their DNA only got chopped up twice. Now, we have these little fragments that are different from one person to the next. And so now if you think about what you know about gel electrophoresis, if we put person A's sample into an electrophoresis well and put person B's sample, they wouldn't look the same after we run them through a gel, right? Because these two middle sections for person A are shorter, they're gonna go further. Person B has this really long section in the middle, it's not gonna go as far. And so the pattern you get in an electrophoresis gel is gonna be different. These pieces that they're cut into have this fun name. Actually, it's a really long name, but the abbreviation is fun. Um, these are called restriction fragment length polymorphisms. It's a really long, I don't know why they come up with such long things, but they're fragments of many different lengths. That's the polymorph part made by restriction enzymes. The abbreviation RFLP is pronounced riflips. So these are riflips that are made from cutting up DNA with restriction enzymes. I actually did this as part of preparing the samples for this lab. We didn't do it in class partly because of time and partly because it doesn't look like you're doing anything. You take a sample of DNA in one of those tiny test tubes, you add another liquid that contains the restriction enzymes, 
and then you just incubate them together so that the enzyme is at a good temperature to work. But in that couple drops of liquid, the enzymes are going through looking for their specific sequence and snipping up the DNA anytime they find it. Okay, so that was already done for these DNA samples that you're running in your gel. Any questions about that part? So this is how we get to the point where electrophoresis will actually do something and show us differences between different samples is by using the differences in those STR regions, those repeating regions of DNA, and using these restriction enzymes that'll find those sequences and chop DNA up, and it'll chop my DNA up differently than yours because the sequences aren't quite the same. So then we can take those sequences and put them into an electrophoresis gel. And this is what you're doing right now, is you're running these samples through a gel to separate out those RIFLIPs to see if the lengths that the DNA was cut into match the crime scene. And that pattern that you get, see how far off this is today, a little bit. Okay, that pattern that you get from a sample of where the bands are located and kind of how they're spread out is sometimes referred to as a DNA fingerprint, not because it has anything to do with your finger, that's a different kind of fingerprint, but as you know, fingerprints, the physical pattern of ridges on your finger is used to identify you, right? Because it's personal and unique and different for everybody. The banding pattern that your DNA makes when it's broken up by a specific restriction enzyme is unique to you. And so it's similar to a fingerprint in the fact that it can be used to identify you and it's slightly different from one person to the next. So it's not actually anything to do with your finger, but it's a unique identifier based on your genetic sequence. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. So our DNA is going to continue to run for a little bit longer. And when it's finished running today, the next step is gonna to be to stain the gel. When you put the samples in there today, the samples looked dark blue. That's not because DNA is dark blue. I added the other thing I did to prepare these after they were digested by the restriction enzymes and all chopped up is I added something called a loading dye that adds color so that you could see what you were doing. Otherwise, if that was clear liquid, it would be almost impossible to tell if you got it in that little tiny well, right? So we add a dye to it so you can see if you got it in there and so we can see how far through the gel that it's moved. But when you go look at those gels today, you'll see the blue dye in there. That is not the DNA. That's an extra thing we added just so there was something visible to us. The DNA molecules are clumped up in little bands within that gel, but they're not visible. And so what we're gonna do at the end of class today is we're gonna take those gels out and we're gonna cover them with a liquid that has a stain in it. And that stain bonds particularly well to DNA molecules and not the rest of the gel. And so it's gonna sit in the stain overnight. And when we come back tomorrow, hopefully, if all goes as planned, when you look at that gel, you will see something that looked like that previous slide that has nice little lines, little bands, where the DNA fragments of different lengths migrated to. And then we'll be able to take our measurements and actually do the analysis of this activity. Do you have any questions about that so far? Okay, so that's about all for um, the lecture kind of part of today. Um, we're going to wait a few more minutes before we stain the gels. And people at home, there's nothing in the lab that you really need to see. We're just going to take the gel out and pour blue liquid over it and let it sit there overnight. Tomorrow, I'll probably put you in a group so that you can gather data with them um, and talk about the results and kind of do some of the analysis together. For the rest of today, while you're waiting to go and stain your gels, you can pull up the part two electrophoresis lab there is some background reading that reviews a lot of the same stuff we talked about in the notes. Um, and I think the first seven questions or so are kind of scattered through that background reading. So you can work on that first part for today. Obviously, when you get to the part where you need to take a photo of your gel and make measurements, you can't do that until tomorrow. So that's what we'll be working on for tomorrow. So people who are online, you are welcome to sign off unless you have any questions for me and just go and work on the background part of that lab. Tomorrow, like I said, I'll probably put you into a group or have you FaceTime somebody um, to get the results from this lab, okay?
All right. Have a great rest of your day, guys. See you later. Tomorrow you will need to take up the oh. job. So there's no picture we need up to now. You don't need to. No. I recommended that you took one yesterday, but we don't need that. Okay. Um,